Well, thank you, Senator Daines. It's really a, quite a privilege and an honor to, uh, to be back home. As uh, Senator said, my roots are here really in Montana. I grew up here, went to college in, uh, in Montana Tech in Butte. My extended family lives here. And as he said, I'm, uh, I got to spend uh, the night in my old bed here in, in Billings with, uh, with my mother, which is great. So my memories uh, traverse really the entire state. They go from uh, Wolf Point to Great Falls to Billings, and even up to uh, Whitefish, where we still have a home today. Uh, certainly, me and my family, we vacation here in the summer and winter, so we are expats, temporarily living in, in Houston, Texas, and we treasure the time we have when we could come up to Montana and since, spend some time in God's country up here. You know, when I graduated from Montana Tech back in 1984, jobs were few and far between for petroleum engineers like myself. We knew that 80 to 90 percent of us probably had to leave the state to go find work. So I'm really particularly pleased today that uh, Montana's economy has grown stronger, the opportunities are here, and that's really thanks to the abundant resources here in Montana. Whether you're a farmer, grain and uh, barley wheat, whether you're a coal miner in the oil and gas business like I am, it really is uh, an abundant resource for the state. It's about its people and really about the leadership. And you have strong leadership in Washington. I spend, uh, uh, my apologies, way too much time in Washington, D.C., Senator, but let me assure you that uh, you have very, very strong leadership uh, with Senator uh, Daines in uh, Montana and, and your Representative Zinke as well, um, and, and Senator Tester. Uh, you have strong representatives in Montana that represent you and your state pretty well. So there really is a lot to talk about in Montana these days. Now, over the past 10 years, there's been a lot, of a lot of renaissance in the U.S. oil and gas natural production business. It certainly helped revive the economy of the Rocky Mountains region and really the entire U.S. Now, of course, the industry's run into a bit of a perfect storm in the marketplace. So my topic today is really how do you drive progress in an energy downturn? I'm going to talk about a number of things, the market situation, the prospects for recovery, how our industry and our company is responding to that, what that means for the energy renaissance, the ongoing importance of technology and innovation in our business, and how Montana can pursue that prosperity. And then we'll have a, a great opportunity for a panel discussion as well. Let me start with the downturn. One of the keys to the oil price collapse has been U.S. liquids production. It's up by 6 million barrels a day since 2008, and that's thanks to the, natural sh the shale revolution that's going on. We're now the world's largest oil producer. Here's another interesting stat. Today, we're the world's largest oil producer, having surpassed Saudi Arabia. In addition, we found so much gas between the US and Canada that we now hold a century of supply. Meanwhile, key events are happening in the marketplace. Now, the world economy is retreating from its high growth that we saw in the mid-2000s. So energy demand has started to slow down. Energy efficiency has started to rise. That's thanks to tougher building standards, more efficient vehicles. So today we have an oversupply in oil, natural gas, and liquefied natural gas, or LNG. And we have weak commodity prices really across the board. And as a result, we've learned something. This business is pretty easy at $100 a barrel, and it's pretty difficult at $30 a barrel. I tell people to put it in perspective. You run your own business. Many of your small business or large business owners out there in Montana today, how many of you experience a 70% drop in your revenues in the course of about eight months' time? And that's what our industry has had to endure. Meanwhile, natural gas is uh, well below $2 per 1,000 BTUs. It's about five times less than what it was in the mid-2000s. So producers like us are fighting to survive. It's a business that's highly volatile, it's cyclical, and it's competitive. Now there's some quick and obvious responses to that. Cutting costs, that was badly needed. Our cost structure went up about fourfold uh, from 2008 to 2012. So now we're all busily trying to capture the deflation in the business and improve our margins. That helps, but it's certainly not enough. Now I'll use some examples at our company to describe a little bit about what companies are doing. We're, operating our, we're optimizing our operating cost procedures. We recognize that getting internally efficient is pretty important. It helps in the high end, it helps in the low side, in the swings. Between this and cost deflation, we anticipate saving several billion dollars annually through the efforts we've made on the cost side. We've also had to cut our capital program. In 2014, as a company, we were spending $17 billion 
to grow and develop the company. We reduced that to $10 billion in 2015, and this year we'll be only spending uh, somewhere around $6 billion. Now, two-thirds of that will go into the development projects, things like um, the Bakken, things like the uh, unconventional shells, because they have a shorter cycle time and a lower cost of supply and are competitive. That's what the Middle East underestimated. The renaissance and the innovation in our business has been so dramatic over the last five years, we found a new source of supply in the globe that's competitive with all the rest of the existing conventional supplies around the world today. And that's what the Middle Eastern producers and many of the others producers didn't recognize, didn't anticipate, and even today don't believe that that's the case. And these shell wells are a great example, things like that, what's going on in the Williston Basin today. Now even so, we've had to reduce our well count, we've had to cut our capital in order to live within the cash flows that we're making because the revenue has gone down so far. We've had to reduce from 10 rigs running in the Bakken to today running one, one rig. And what we've also learned is that we're having a pretty big impact on the broader economy. It's not, so that the energy business, the coal, the oil, and the gas side is having a pretty tremendous impact on the broad economy because a lot of that investment is being spent here in North America and in the U.S. And in recent years, there's some economists that have added up the capital investment globally that, uh, that, that our energy business represents, and it now stands at about 30% of all the capital being spent around the whole world. Now, cuts in the oil and gas business since 2015 and projected through the next three to four years, that's those cuts are predicted to total 1.6 trillion, that's a T, trillion, Dollars. So it's having a pretty significant and massive impact, not only on the United States and North America, but on around the whole globe as well. These cuts are impacting the business sectors around the world, the supply chain, and really the broader economy. Most economists now, now look back and they say that the lack of investment in the U.S. oil and gas business reduced the GDP in the U.S. by 0.4 percentage points. Now that may not seem like a lot, but you're talking about only growing at 2 to 3 percent as an economy. So that's what the impact due to the lack of investment in our business has had just on the U.S. economy. But fortunately, the U.S. is still growing. But the question for producers and producing states is what lies ahead with res regard to the current downturn. You know, one of my coworkers jo joked recently, an ancient per Persian philosopher, he was called before the emperor and he said, uh, tell me two great truths that will stand out throughout eternity. The philosopher thought for a minute and said, oil prices will remain uncertain. And the second truth is, this too shall pass, and this too shall pass. So I entered the industry, as Senator Dane said, back in 1984, just in time for the first oil collapse that I experienced. Um, I'm in my sixth downturn in this business, and I've been through five upturns, and I'm waiting for the sixth upturn, and it will come. I guarantee you it will come. Now, historically, low prices have always forced investment rates to be reduced. So drilling activity goes down, and production usually follows. The decline elsewhere, and, and that U.S. production has done that. We've seen the decline start with the lack of that investment. Now, declines elsewhere around the world could take longer because there are longer cycle times and a lot of investment's been going on in the last five years, but some of that decline in non-OPEC, non-U.S. production will start here uh, and, and, is, uh, and is going on right now today as well. Now, meanwhile, low prices tend to stimulate demand, and that's occurring as well. We did see that last year. So in theory, today's low oil prices are already sowing the seeds of the next upturn. And currently, the world today, we have a pretty narrow surplus of about one to two million barrels a day. That's about how fast the global economy is growing, so it should eat up that surplus uh, in the next, uh, next few months. We do watch storage inventories quite a bit. They're pretty high right now, but they will turn, they will flatten, and they will start to decline. And after that, the market will ultimately strengthen. But the problem in this business is you have to think about different scenarios, different things that may happen to you. Now, the rebalancing could happen faster because some of that production may go off the market. For example, we could have geopolitical events around the world, all the unrest in the Middle East, and some of those OPEC-producing countries could stop, stop adding supply to the business. Or we could have more declines in non-OPEC uh, supply. Now, some of the OPEC members plan to meet on April 17th and talk about supply. So maybe they will come up with an effort to try to reduce the amount of supply and correct that one to two million barrels a day of overbalance. But on the other hand, there's counteracting events that could also happen. 
there's more oil coming on stream from Iraq and Iran. Since we signed the, uh, the nuclear deal with uh, Iran, and uh, they're going to be coming back into the market, some say as much as one and a half to two million barrels a day. Now, we could have demand weakening on the growth. Uh, the growing nations of, of Asia Pacific, China, and other places, the demand could weaken across the world. So it really depends on how all these factors play out that we don't have a lot of control on that could end up impacting the market volatility. The market could go up, it could go down, or it could swing back and forth. Now, in that scenario, the swing back and forth, U.S. shell production will wind up becoming some of the marginal supply, meaning that if oil prices can rise or fall, U.S. production will rise or fall in response to those prices. And that's because we can ramp up the rigs and ramp down the rigs pretty quickly. Now, we don't know if this will be a blip or will be a curve for the long time, but our internal view is that prices will remain relatively weak as we progress through 2016. Inventories will start to correct themselves later this year, and we ought to see a price recovery coming in 2017. We believe that in really these uncertain markets, uh, companies that will fare the best will have four characteristics. First, a diverse portfolio that includes assets with a low cost of supply. And again, companies in North American shale have that characteristic in their portfolio. It's this low cost of supply that uh, protect the investment returns even as commodity prices downturn. Now, the second characteristic is you need a legacy company that's built with a lot of legacy assets and low production decline. So you can manage through the low price environments and still have uh, your revenues and your cash flows coming. Third, low capital intensity. You want to have assets that don't require a lot of capital to be put back into the business to keep your production growing and growing, and you need that low cost of supply and a deep inventory of projects to invest in. And then fourth, you better have a strong balance sheet. You better be able to go through these downturns, take a period of 70% drop in revenue, be able to borrow money with a strong balance sheet, power through the decline, to, uh, to be in a position to reinvest back when the, the market starts to rise on the other end. And that way you can take advantage of these upturns that are coming. Now, I've talked about market uncertainty and how, how to respond to it, but I can assure you that that uncertainty doesn't extend to the U.S. energy renaissance. It's here to stay. As I said, the, I think many of the producers around the world underestimated the technology and the innovation that's come to the U.S. Uh, energy, energy business. Last April, oil production reached its highest in 45 years as a country. Now, it's fallen, but it's only fallen by about 4% since that time. Meanwhile, our proven reserves in the U.S. are also at a 45-year high, and they're up 90% in just the last six years. So, too, natural gas, U.S. natural gas production is an all-time high. Proven reserves are up, in this case, 128% just over the last 20 years. So the U.S. shale resource that we have blessed with in the United States is enormous, and we're in the early innings of its development. There are more than a dozen productive shale opportunities in the lower 48, plus several more in Alaska and Canada. And when you add that to the Canadian oil sands, which are the world's third largest petroleum deposit, only behind Saudi Arabia and Venezuela, you can see North America, North America has a bright future in production growth. Now, that has been sidetracked a little bit over the last... Uh, the last year or so, but it's only, only uh, due to the downturn. The resources that we have in the ground aren't going away, so when prices recover, growth will come, it will resume. The extent or the speed of that recovery will obviously be, be a factor of how quickly the oil price recovers. Of course, you know, this means more than just industry statistics. You know, one of the government officials told us a few years ago that most of the major issues facing our country today relate somehow to energy. And I think that's what Senator Dane was talking about a lot with the, uh, the programs that you heard yesterday. You know, economic prosperity, job creation, the balance of trade, foreign relations, climate protection, air and water quality, just go on and on, intersects with the energy business. And I'm just going to mention a few of those connections. You know, the driver this morning, you look out and you see $1.90 a gallon gasoline prices. Um, if I deflate that back to $1,962, the year that I was born, uh, that equals about 25 cents a gallon. So from that standpoint, the good old days are here, right? Thanks to that energy renaissance. Now, with the U.S. transition from energy scarcity to abundance, um, our standing in the world has changed as well. And the senator talked about this. Our national energy security has improved. We no longer need to import liquefied natural gas or as much oil as we've uh, imported in the past. It certainly enhanced the balance of trade with our country. And as for natural gas, it's selling today at bargain basement prices. We've got home heating costs, electricity costs. It's jump-started U.S. manufacturing. 
We now see new facilities that are being built in North America and in the U.S. that hadn't been contemplated in the last 20 years. Chemicals, petrochemicals, metals, fertilizer, automobiles, equipment manufacturing, and the list goes on and on. Until recently, such plants have only been built in other countries around the world. Now they're coming here thanks to our abundant energy at a reasonable cost, and that means jobs. At the peak a couple of years ago, our industry alone employed 2.6 million U.S. jobs, and that's just direct. If you count the indirect and the direct, that's over 9.8 million jobs as an industry. We generated about 8 percent of the U.S. gross domestic product. Now, we don't know how much those numbers have declined, and they have declined a little bit with this downturn, but we remain part of the economic backbone of the United States. And then there are environmental benefits. People don't want to recognize it, but there are. U.S. natural gas and power generation has helped the U.S. cut our energy-related greenhouse gas emissions. They're at their lowest levels since the early 1990s. We are the one country that didn't sign the Kyoto Protocol. We're the only country that has met the Kyoto Protocol. And that's dramatic. That's important to understand. And as for the future, the economies worldwide are going to continue to develop. Their energy demand is going to grow up, as the Senator remarked about earlier. And all forms of energy are going to be needed. It truly is all the above. Um, for decades, we're going to need fossil fuels. We're going to need coal. We're going to need renewables, everything to meet the growing energy demand around the world. Now, in a market like today, as well as many of the foreseeable future scenarios that you might envision, technology and innovation remain essential. You know, for example, despite the downturn, we're seeing higher initial volumes coming from the shale wells. Recoveries are up. Um, the shale technology today is where conventional reservoirs were 30 to 40 years ago, and more progress is yet to come. We're already achieving success in driving down the cost of supply and making this a supply source that is very competitive across the globe. We're innovating longer horizontal wells. We're connecting more of those laterals to, uh, to the rock through greater <clears throat> and better hydraulic uh, fracture stimulations. We're getting 200 in each lateral now when we were only getting 30 to 40 just a couple of years ago. That creates more micro fissures in the rock and creates a greater opportunity for that oil to flow into the well bore. On the surface, we're doing a lot of things to uh, concentrate more wells on fewer pads. That cuts our costs, reduce our drilling. It reduces our water use, reduces our footprint, and becomes more sustainable. We're looking at hundreds of options and, and a few basic applications. We're doing this through reduced facility design. We're, we're doing our inventory control. We're doing all the things. We're even using big data. Today, our company has one of the 30th fastest and largest computers in the world today. We use that to analyze seismic data. We look at all the low-cost sensors we have in the business today. We analyze that to make sure we're doing the things the most appropriate, the quickest, the fastest, and the cheapest we can. And we know there's going to be hundreds of other innovations out there in the future. Let me pivot just a minute to Montana. And what, uh, let's look at what Montana can do to drive its own progress as well. And I think first and fortunately and foremost, the Montana recognizes that, it's, uh, that it has an important set of resources, whether you're talking about timber, uh, farming, coal, oil, and gas. Um, it, it's all the minerals as well. Gas heats half the homes here in Montana today. Oil and gas uh, together represent about 40,000 jobs statewide. That's over 6% of the jobs in Montana. That generated nearly 8% of the state's total labor income. Now, the commodity price has hurt and it's it and has reacted and has hit Montana's economy as well. State unemployment runs about 4.1 percent. That's up from about 3.5 percent when I spoke here about a year ago. But it's a full point below the U.S. average. Now, there are things our Montana can do to uh, maximize its opportunities, beginning with government. It should continue to be business friendly on a regulatory and a legislative approach. It benefits all, all businesses, including energy. Keys to this are reasonable and stable legislative and regulatory measures regarding taxation and environmental oversight. Even consider incentives to bring the right businesses back to Montana. Another key is maintaining that cooperative relationship with businesses. Not all states do this, I guarantee you, and Montana is one that does. Montana clearly is, is uh, represent your strong story to Washington. I mean, everybody out here in the West, uh, in the U.S., Western U.S., knows that federal policymakers see things a lot differently than we do back in Washington, D.C. So it's uh, really important to get that message back there that's important to the western states of the U.S. 
And I'll also say, and I think Montana does this, but I would reemphasize, we have some, some of my friends here from Montana Tech today, but support of and investment in education is essential. The reality is that Montana has to compete for new business opportunities. The educational level of its people must be a prime selling point for the state. You know, our, our universities uh, must compete for the best students and the best faculty, the ones who can carry us into the future. To do this, they must continually involve. There's always going to be industries and professions on the rise, and some will be on the fall. Some will be strong, some will be declining. So the curriculum in the universities can never be set in stone. And we also have to have, to have attractive facilities in which our students can live and learn. And just as importantly, we cannot wait until college to encourage academic achievement. Educators today tell us that the leading indicator of future high school and college success is taking and passing Algebra I. And you need to be doing that as early as the seventh grade. So we have to encourage uh, study of the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. Not everyone needs to go into these fields, but it enhances their rigor and their ability to engage in critical thinking and problem solving. And so the extent, the extent to which Montana can encourage this is going to provide it with a competitive advantage. And so too is a renewed emphasis on our occupational and vocational training. And it's going to help prepare our kids for the greater, uh, greater that have that kind of an aptitude in those kinds of arenas. So in closing, let me just emphasize a couple things, uh, some key points. You know, the commodity price downturn, it really has hit the industry pretty hard, but this too shall pass. Though recovery might take a little while, might be slower, and it could be a little bit uneven, it is coming. The doubt, and that downturn, it's not ended the U.S. energy renaissance. The resource potential remains strong, compelling, and competitive in the global, global economy. Now, technology and innovation are going to be key and increasingly important levers as, uh, as we try to react, lower our cost of supply, and become more competitive. And there, I think there are things that Montana, Montana can do to drive that progress, even in an energy downturn. So thank you, and I look forward to your questions.